It is a great Saturday morning. It may be allergy season, but man, it smells good. Good morning and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and in for Matt Allen is Glenn Hayward from Good Works Auto Repair. And we are here to help you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon, right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. We're creating realistic, realistic expectations when it comes to auto repair. If you've got car questions, we've got answers. So we encourage you to give us a call and give us a call early at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, as Pilar mentioned, batteries, batteries, batteries. How to handle car batteries. Glenn with GoodWorks Auto Repair has brought in a friend of his who is a battery expert to help us help you with your car. Who have you got brought, Glenn? Good morning, Dave. Uh, I brought with me C. Michael Decker. He is a guy who's been in the battery business for decades, and he's going to tell us a lot of stuff that you didn't know and maybe some stuff you don't even want to know about your battery this morning. So I'm going to introduce him right now. Take it away, C. Michael. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate being here and uh, look forward to answering any questions that anyone may have. Well, if you've got questions, don't hesitate to give us a call. It doesn't have to be about batteries, but you know now's a good time to take advantage of it. Batteries are such a huge issue in our business, and uh, we're always talking about rule changes, the way we used to fix cars 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago. Batteries were less important, but cars, as they become highly electronic with uh, multiple, multiple computer modules, all those modules got to have good voltage, and that all starts at the... Uh, the uh, platform of the battery. So you got to have a good battery, good battery charging system. Some things that uh, come up when we're talking about batteries is what do you do when your battery's dead on the side of the road? Do you want to call the uh, the uh, company out there to come sh- change out your battery? Is that the right way to go about it, Glenn? I don't know about you, man, but uh, those guys are, in my estimation, selling snake oil and in, a, in many senses, they're just trying to get you to come into one of their shops and sell you a bunch of other stuff that you may or may not need. You sound awful opinionated about this, but uh, I've, I've never seen the side of the road as a good place to do a battery because when you do a battery, you want a good alternator check, uh, look at the belt, look at the belt tensioner, because if you have a weak alternator, it's going to take out your battery, and vice versa. If you've got a bad battery, it can take out your alternator. Correct. There's, there's underlying causes why batteries fail. There can be draws in the system. It could be a malfunctioning alternator. Um, there's diodes and different things in alternators that start to fail, and they can create draws on the, on the battery even when the car is shut off. And we're going to talk about some things a little bit later on the show that we've had come into our shop that have caused people's batteries to go dead over a two- or three-day period. They come back out, the battery's dead. They charge it up. They've put in new batteries. They've changed alternators. They've done a lot of stuff on their own and spent hundreds of dollars, and yet they've never come to the underlying cause of why that battery went dead. Well, you said Charles has been in this industry for decades. It's actually 30-plus years. He's worked on the manufacturing side of things. He's worked on the di- distribution side of things. Uh, he's actually done some uh, design work with some engineers, and uh, he's also done a lot of failure analysis. And the thing I want to know, are all batteries the same, or is there a difference? Uh, all batteries are not created equal. All batteries are not created equal. So there could be a difference in a battery that's $80 versus one that's $110? Absolutely. You get what you pay for when it comes to a battery. The uh, thing about batteries that uh, we're talking about, all the electronics on cars and and, uh, having good voltage uh, to the car, and we see cars on a regular basis that come in with a check engine light or a shifting concern because I happen to be in the transmission business, and the first thing we test in the door is the battery. And... uh, when I call people and say, you know what, your transmission's not bad, but you got a bad battery, they say, what do you mean? It starts the car. Is that, is that, does that mean it's bad? I mean, it starts the car. Well, there's so many other issues that can, uh, can cause that transmission to have problems, uh, mainly voltage drops from corrosion in your terminals, uh, in your battery cables themselves, or even the age of the battery, because as a battery ages, the capacity of the battery diminishes. So the older the battery, the less of ability it has to provide power. Now, Glenn, when you test batteries in your shop, are you surprised at how many are bad that come in starting just fine? I mean, it's literally like one in five. Am I, am I, am I stretching it? That are, uh, that are actually testing bad uh, with this capacity test and these testers that we use. They still start the car, but maybe one has, you know, it's rated for 600 cold cranking amps and it's testing out at about 450. That's going to start the car, but when you put all the loads with the air conditioning and the headlights and all the other things going on, it's not good enough. 
Right. It's it's hard sometimes to convince a customer that their battery is marginally bad. We use what we call a carbon pile tester, which draws the battery down. We hold it at about 250 amps for 30 seconds. We release the draw from it, draw it down again to 250 amps for another 30 seconds. We're trying to recreate the draw that a starter would typically put on a vehicle and see how much capacity that battery has to hold its charge. And so if it tests be under nine, eight and a half volts, it's marginally bad. It needs to stay around nine to nine and a half, sometimes 10 volts. A brand new battery will stay 10, 10 and a half volts at that draw for that period of time. So well, I guess so the point I want to make is don't shoot your mechanic because he told you you need a new battery when you drove it in and it started just fine. Uh, batteries in general, as a rule of thumb, I say, you know, in, in this climate, uh, they last two years. And that's probably an extreme, but, you know, sometimes they last a year. And I've seen cheap batteries last six months. Uh, is that what you find, Charles? Uh, along that same lines, um, people need to understand that cold temperatures will rob a battery of power, but hot temperatures will actually cause physical damage internally to the battery. So the hotter the climate, the more physical damage you're going to have on a daily basis inside of your battery. What is it about the heat that's actually doing damage on the inside of that battery? Uh, Several things. Um, The the hotter acid, uh, higher temperature acid is more corrosive. So as the battery discharges and the plate absorbs electrolyte, that electrolyte is more corrosive to the lead. Also, the lead under a higher temperature is softer. So the plates have a tendency to buckle. Uh, I think everybody has seen a battery that has bulged out. Mm. Well, that's typically a a, uh, lead plate that has gotten too hot and has buckled. Well, the thing I notice about dead batteries is they never come at the opportune time. So you get on your your tux, you're going to go to a wedding or whatever it may be, you go get in the car and click. So if I'm a consumer and I want to open the hood and see if I got a good battery or not, um, well, you should be at a regular shop that's checking your battery every time you go in the door just to prevent that from happening. But if you look at it and you see bulging coming out the side and it's two-plus years old, you got one in your near future. And they do put these long prorated warranties on them where they say, oh, this battery's got a 72-month warranty on it. Uh, that's becoming less common that they're warranting them that way, but it gives us the impression that somehow this battery is going to last 72 months. Now, there's, there's the rare occasions where they do, and sometimes you get lucky on a battery where they go longer than expected but if you're buying a battery in two years, you know, you didn't do anything wrong, that's, that's pretty typical in our shops. We see that on a regular basis. Right. The typical uh, wet lead-acid battery that you find in vehicles is designed to last five years. Uh, so that has a design life of five years. That means a service life of two to three, uh, typically because the design life is uh, in, in a laboratory in perfect conditions. Right. Under the perfect temperature it is designed to last five years. Well, under the hood of your car in the middle of summer when it's 114 degrees out, and let's say it's not the 120 degree day, but just the 114 degree day, so pretty mild uh, July summer you know, day here in Arizona. Glenn, what would you venture to say the temperature underneath that hood is? It can get over 200 degrees real easy. Uh, you could probably fry eggs on the outside of the hood without even having to bat an eyelash, even if you were in the shade because of the internal heat penetrating through and making that sheet metal hot and everything that's under it. So um, <clears throat> if I bring my car to Good Works Auto Repair and I need a battery or you call me up and I don't think I know I need a battery, you call me up, you say you need a battery and it's going to cost this much money. What are the things you're going to do to make it a successful battery installation? Because I know we've all seen someone take a battery and try and put a square block and a round hole to make a battery fit or fit the wrong battery or they beat on the battery cable end to make it fit over the post but there's a lot of cleaning that needs to happen because that battery is full acid and that acid is corroding things like uh, the uh, connection wire so what would you do to to clean that up well the process really I mean is examining the battery so many manufacturers now are using a very thin metal that goes around the battery post itself and due to the corrosive nature of batteries and the acidity and so on, it starts to eat those those terminals away, and it gets the material gets so thin that even if you clamp the post, you clamp the battery terminal down all the way down on the post, you can still spin it around with your fingers, and that creates other problems. Now you've got arcing going on that you can't visibly see 
but the arcing is going on a Star City Road even more so on the battery terminal as well as the post of the battery. And sometimes you may go out to the to your car and you turn the key and you don't get anything, not even a click. And you go out there and you can spin the terminal with your hands and you find that it's loose. And that's what has created that looseness is the fact that that metal is very thin and it is either stretched or it has eroded away and now the battery terminal is loose and it needs to be replaced. Well, real good. When we come back, my grandpappy always told me that I could pour Coca-Cola on the battery to get it cleaned up. We're going to find out if that is true or false. And we're taking your calls at 602-277-5827. KTR, you're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. And Matt Allen's not here today. He ditched me. He never heard that line from uh, Top Gun, never leave your wingman, but apparently he wanted to go on vacation, so we will forgive him. So we've got Glenn Hayward from Good Works Auto Repair in with us, and we've also got C. Michael Decker in with us as our battery expert. So if you've got battery questions or you've got any question, give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR, and Michael, can I clean my battery with uh, Coca-Cola? Is it going to do anything for me? Uh, it'll clean your battery terminal, but uh, you would be better off to use uh, some baking soda and water to kill the corrosion that's on it. You may notice the presence of ants shortly thereafter as the Coca-Cola drips down to the bottom, or you get your, your shoe in it and you drag it into the house and your wife wants to kill you. <laughs> well, I've heard that Coca-Cola will take the rust off of a gun barrel, so... It will probably clean a battery terminal also. But we drink it all day long. But it must be good for you. I mean, it's good for battery cables. It's got to be good for you. What we do is, uh, in in our shop when we're working on battery cable ends, is we do clean them uh, with the baking soda and water. We'll put the cable in in a cup of water, swish that around, let that get cleaned up real good. And then when it's installed back on the battery, we actually have a sealer that prevents some of that corrosion. So when you see red stuff on your battery post... And if you're an average, everyday consumer who likes to look under your hood or you're going to change a battery yourself, go for it if you're mechanical. More power to you. But the thing I'm going to recommend is a major, major safety issue is that batteries do blow up. So that's uh, definitely reason to put on safety glasses. Uh, bar your wife's sunglasses if you're going to be doing it, or bar your husband's if you're going to be doing it. <laughs> but uh, you definitely want safety glasses on. Because what happens, uh, I'm going to let uh, Michael explain that to us, uh, in the gases that come out of that battery. Well, the components that are present um, come from the water that's in the battery. The water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, both very explosive substances. As a battery is uh, having a load pulled on it when you're starting your car or when it's under charge, it's uh, splitting that water into hydrogen and oxygen, and that gas will gather in the space above the plates inside the battery, and it will also linger on the outside of the battery Uh, It gets out through the vent caps or sometimes around the terminal. And so that gas is lingering there, and any any spark or open flame can cause that to ignite. I always recommend that you smoke a cigarette while changing your battery. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say there, I was talking to Michael a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me that there's only three major battery manufacturers uh, basically around around the earth. Is that correct? Well, in the U.S., there's only three... um, major manufacturers left. Uh, Everything else has been moved offshore. Or um, in the case of like China, there are over 2,000 battery manufacturers in China. But now they manufacture to two different specifications. So when you're, when you're, let's say you're a brand name, uh, Acme uh, Battery Company, you're going to go have this thing produced. You're going to design it to what you want to fit your economic profile, and then you're going to say, hey, I want a battery built like this. So when we say there's different grades of batteries, yeah, there, there literally is different grades. Even though it's going through one actual manufacturer, it's to a different specification, which makes it way different. We're going to go with, it looks like, KD in Phoenix on a 2005, looks like a Nissan Sentra. Go ahead. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is not specifically related to the battery, but it's related to the something else. So I don't know whether it's the right time to ask that question. Go for it. Okay, so I have Sentra 2005. My uh, check engine light came on uh, about three weeks ago, and uh, I checked the code. It was uh, it was the second cylinder misfire. So um, I haven't done the tune-up, so I changed the spark plugs, and... Uh, and resetted the code by removing the battery terminal 
and uh, drove it for like about 150 200 mile and nothing came on so i thought it's done but and all of a sudden it came on the light so uh, check the code again it was still uh, the second cylinder misfire so the second guess was the coil so i swapped the coil between the cylinder 1 and 2 and uh, drove it like 15 miles and then the code came back on and checked it again it was multiple cylinders misfired so the guy in AutoZone actually recommended to put a sea foam and uh, so i did the sea foam filled the tank and moved the coil back to their original position and drove another 15 20 miles and the code came back on and uh, it's still at uh, peace i mean the multiple cylinders misfired okay i think uh, looks like glenn has got uh, got some input there on your questions go ahead glenn well, typically, it sounds like you took a lot of the right steps to swap the coils out and see if the cylinder misfire moved. But you may have some wiring issues. You may even have some problems with uh, with a, an injector or something electronic. So it's something that's going to need more than just a code read. There's going to have to be some pinpoint diagnostics done on the uh, coils and injectors to ensure that uh, everything is functioning the way it's supposed to. There could even be a problem within the ECM itself. Well, we started out with a uh, just a specific cylinder misfiring. We moved moved the coil, and then we ended up with a random cylinder misfire. So we could have other issues. Vacuum leak going on could be part of the problem. We could have some other issue. I don't think the sea foam was going to fix anything. That's just, uh, it needs to be diagnosed. Um, you know, you can take a stethoscope and put it right back on the on the fuel injector and listen to a fuel injector. I mean, that's one thing you could do. Sometimes when they're e- readily easy to change, we'll actually swap fuel injectors. I, I may also uh, comment that I hope that you put good spark plugs in there because like a Bosch Platinum Plus 4 or something that AutoZone will typically sell every customer who walks in, regardless of whether it's the correct uh, spark plug or not, can create more problems than it can resolve. Thanks so much for the call, KD. We've got another open line at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. We're going to go to Rich in Mesa. He's calling with a battery question. Go ahead, Rich. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thank you. Hey, I was wondering, um, I've got a smart battery charger. I don't know what that owl means, but I know it's really electronic. Uh bunch of selections on it and there's a a selection on there that if you push it pulsates and i guess you're supposed to well it suggests that you do this every so often to your battery and it sends an electrical pulse through your battery and i guess it helps maintain it and it'll extend the life is that true i'm glad charles is here i'm going to let him take that one go ahead charles okay yeah that that is a setting that you find on a lot of chargers and it's also called a desulfation cycle And what it will do is it will pulse a higher voltage into the battery and try to loosen some sulfation off the plates that occurs as batteries get older. Um, You'll get some plate growth or grid growth that starts to happen, and it's called sulfation. Any place that that sulfation is on the plate, that portion of the plate doesn't produce electricity. So the pulse mode helps that battery to knock the sulfation off the plate and then go into a regular charging cycle. So, yes, that's a valid and very good charger that you have there. Well, Rich, thanks so much for the call. If you guys have any questions related to auto repair, don't hesitate. We are talking batteries. That is our topic today because we all buy one, seems like, every two years. We hope they last longer for two years for you. We're just going to call that the average. If you get three, four years out of a battery, great. But what we don't want to see is we don't want to see that battery lacking power to to run the car the way it should run the car. The other thing we don't want to see is they put that battery right over the transmission. So when it starts to leak acid, it's getting all over the wires that go to the transmission. Chrysler loves to put the computer next to the battery, so you're getting acid over there on the battery. So when we come back, we're taking your calls at 602-277-5827. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. The automotive therapist, and I don't have Matt here because he's on vacation and he left his wingman. So filling in for Matt, we've got Glenn Hayward with Good Good Works Auto Repair in Tempe, playing co-host today. And then we've got C. Charles Decker uh, in studio, our battery expert. So if you've got battery questions, if you've got any question for that matter, all you got to do is give us a call at 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTAR, and 
my wife, my son is playing Little League right now, and he's eight years old, and I keep getting pictures of him crossing home plate that he got a hit. So way to go, son. Good job. And it uh, looks like she t- sent me a text. They won 12 to 1. So I don't, wow. know, I don't know if the other team had a, a ring. Blowout. Yeah, total blowout, you know. I-, I thought they kept these things more even than that. Speaking of blowouts, you know, we've got three guys with hair in the studio. That's kind of nice, too. I've been in here some days where I got three bald guys doing the show with me. We all got hair. We all got eyebrows. It's it, it's amazing. amazing. So up first this segment, we are going to go with Wayne in Santan Valley on a 2002 Buick Rendezvous. Go ahead, Wayne. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah. Hi. Uh, listen, I've got uh, 160 thousand on it, and uh, had the transmission rebuilt about 75 or 80 something like that. And now it seems that every time I use the cruise control, it wants to downshift by itself. So when you're, how fast are you going when that happens? Oh, around 65, 70. 65 or 70, but transmission has all four gears, so one, two, three, four. It's a it's a 4T65, so it's a four-speed transmission. That all right. that all functions normally. Yeah. Uh, but the, the minute you go to cruise control, that you drop out of fourth gear is what you're feeling. How much do you well, see? No, 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 just arbitrarily. In other words, I could be cruising along, and all of a sudden it'll downshift. It'll just, it'll just downshift for no reason. Exactly. We've got no check engine lights, or is there check engine lights no. going on? And I had my mechanic, uh, he plugged in a, you know, some kind of a meter, and he said there's nothing in the system that indicates a problem. Let's say you're doing that 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, whatever you're doing. When you say it downshifts, is there a tachometer yeah. on that car, so an engine speed? And yeah. How, much, yeah. how many RPMs do you see it change? Do you see it I'm, change? Well, I'm usually cruising around uh, 20 or 2,000. Then it'll, it'll, uh, when it downshifts, it goes to about 3,000 or 2,800. Okay, so we're definitely getting a 4-3 downshift. Now, that shifting is controlled by two things. Two, two, there's a lot of things that control the shifting, but the two major things that come into play is going to be the throttle position sensor. That tells the computer how much your foot is into the gas. And now it, the computer compares the throttle position sensor to a vehicle speed sensor. So when you're in the cruise control mode, we may be having some sort of issue with the throttle position sensor or the, the uh the actual mechanism that, that makes the throttle go for the cruise control could be an issue, uh, or we have a vehicle speed sensor issue where that's dropping out and pulling it down a gear. Any thoughts there, Glenn? I think that Dave's on the right track there. This does not have fly-by wire. It should be a cable system for O2, so uh, I don't see that there could be any issues there, but the TPS could be an underlying cause, and uh, you know that's something that needs to be looked at by someone who's able to sweep the TPS and watch the voltage on it. And the other thing I would say is that, yeah, you're going to need, it may need to be driven with your mechanic, so he may need to drive it. He's going to have a scanner on it. He's going to have the data or the output of that computer, and one of them is going to be for the TPS. Some people call it an app sensor, which is an accelerated position uh, sensor. Um, he's going to need to be looking at that, and the other thing he needs to look at is that speed sensor. And we've got to see which one of those drops out to change which gear the computer is commanding it to be in. That transmission doesn't tell the car when it's going to shift. The car tells the transmission when it's going to shift. So that's a great question. We are going to go to, it looks like, Rego in Phoenix on a 2006 Lexus uh, 350. I imagine that's maybe an RX 350. Go ahead, Rego. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Uh, yeah, I got a 2006 IS 350, and uh, it's got a P402 code, and uh, I replaced all four uh, oxygen sensors cleared the code, and it still pops up. Glenn, what's coming to mind for you? Well, there's a couple things in mind. He may need some uh, some wiring issue. He may he could have some wiring issues. Or he could have something going on in the in the PCM itself, and he may need to have some uh, some downloads done on the PCM. Hey, hey, Rigo, that code, that PO402, do you remember what the definition of it was? Was it specifically for uh, one sensor or the other? Uh, no, I just said, uh, I think bank one, um, what was it, bank one something. Okay, but you went ahead and replaced all of them? 
Yeah, I, I replaced, you know, because I figured it, the car has 100,000 miles, so I figured, okay, it's time to replace them. So I replaced the two up top and then the two on the bottom. But all this happened after I see from the car. Um, so I figured I might have messed up the O2 sensors by doing that because it was running rough. So I see foamed it, started running smooth, and then the code pops up like 50 miles later, and then I replace the sensors. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's one of the things there. You replace a sensor, and the code pointed you there. But to be honest with you, it's it's not all the time that an O2 sensor code is a bad O2 sensor. And I can't I can't imagine that you would have more than one go bad at the same time. This is where we get paid for what we do, and that's in the diagnostic end of things. If you went to a shop and they replaced all your O2 sensors and you paid a big bill and you came back because the light was on, you would be livid. So that's where we want consumers, when you guys go to auto shops, to be, be happy and willing to pay for diagnostic. That's the cheapest money you can spend, and it feels like a, you know, because it's not a, a tangible item, it feels like unnecessary, and why am I paying for that? But it's actually the intellectual knowledge and the testing that goes on to make sure that we get it right. Go ahead, Glenn. Well, so many of the O2 sensors, as we generically call them, are actually air-fuel ratio sensors, and they're like twice as expensive as a regular old a four wire, even a two wire, a single wire um, O2 sensor, and so you can you can spend eight hundred, nine hundred bucks on fuel, air fuel ratio sensors and be just as frustrated as you might be fifty miles later than before you started. You may have a vacuum leak, you may have some other issues going on that are that are causing that problem to uh, to occur that have nothing to do whatsoever with the oxygen sensors. Their sensing is a problem, but that doesn't mean the sensor's wrong. Actually, the sensor's working because it's telling the computer, hey, there's a problem here. And what we would do in our shop, we'd be looking at the, the output again. We were talking about data. Data from a TPS sensor is no different than data from a you know, speed sensor is no different than data from a oxygen sensor. And since Charles is here, I'm going to pull this full circle into batteries. I've seen O2 codes for bad batteries. What do you think, Charles? Uh, you're the expert on the codes, but uh, yeah, bad batteries can cause a lot of problems when they're under voltage or over voltage. Uh, so if your uh, if your alternator is putting out more than it should, your regulator has gone, uh, and you've got runaway current going into your battery, uh, that can spike your computer system, give you false readings on your uh, sensors. Uh, same thing with under voltage. If your battery has lost a cell, uh, typically you get 2.12 volts per cell. So you've got six cells in your battery. You're going to have somewhere between 12.7 and 13.6 volts. If your battery's only showing 10, you may have lost one cell. And that will definitely affect the uh, the computer and all the sensors attached to it. Thanks so much for the call, Rigo. We're going to go with Marvin in Phoenix uh, on a 2007 Toyota Camry. Go ahead, Marvin. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, thank you. I appreciate all the information on uh, batteries. Uh, but I have uh, another question. Can I can I wash my engine with a hose? You know, like I have a friend. He says he sprays, you know, a liquid soap on it all over it, and then just hoses it all off. Yeah, you bet. Um, you sure can uh, wash your battery with a hose. Um, I'm always we're always sensitive when we wash the wash the engine with a hose because just like the last caller he had a Lexus and he washed his engine and now all of a sudden he's got an issue so um, yeah definitely uh, you know I know at Virginia Auto where Matt is at they wash engines on a regular basis as part of their service and uh, they, they totally believe in it so uh, any thoughts on that Glenn as far as what they could harm washing their engine well sometimes it depends on the amount of pressure where you're pointing the hose at the time, but, you know, you can get water where, and start corrosive processes where they're really not intended to be. Uh, if you're washing your engine because it's got grease or oil buildup on it, it sounds like you may need to do some resealing before you clean anything in those parts. Of course, you'll wash while you have them off of the vehicle. If you're not able to do that yourself, then you need to take it somewhere. And we have uh, giant dishwashers called CUDAs, and we put those parts wa those parts in the parts washer, and they're using soapy water with a special soap that cleans all of the stuff off. But externally washing uh, engines can be kind of iffy, and like I say, 
uh, you, you can start a corrosive process or get water in some of the electrical areas where they shouldn't belong. And computers and different things are located in different areas in the vehicle, and they may not have adequate protection because they're not built to have water washed onto them. Well, I think it, you definitely, Marvin, if you're going to do it, and uh, that's not to say you shouldn't do it, but uh, I washed my engine off in my Honda Element. After 30,000 miles, the thing looked terrible, you know, so I just did some light soap, spray that on there, and just rinse everything down real light with a garden hose, but don't get aggressive on it because that's going to, like Glenn said, it's going to get in spots you don't want it to get. Everything is kind of covered by rubber boots. It's important, those areas, but it doesn't mean some water can't get trapped in there. The nice thing about Arizona is it dries everything out. So we are going to go with Larry on a battery question. Go ahead, Larry. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I, just, uh, I don't know if you've answered this yet or not. I've got a car that I don't drive much. It's basically for show and stuff like that or recreational drive. So it's in storage most of the time. And so the battery's in it. But what's the proper way to store it? That is a great question. And we were talking just before the show about uh, parasitic draw and, you know, vehicles that sit. There are going to be draws on the battery in the off time. But, Charles, how should he store that thing? Well, the best way to do it would be to disconnect one of the terminals of the battery. That way you eliminate the parasitic draw. Um, you also need to keep that battery charged even if you're not using it. Uh, as a battery discharges, the plates absorb the electrolyte in the water and it corrodes the plates. Uh, so then when you do go back and recharge it, it doesn't come back to full charge. So if you keep it charged, uh, just say once a month or put uh, what's called a battery maintainer on it that would keep a small amount of current going into it. Uh, that would keep that battery charged and keep you in good shape. The other option is to go with a dry cell battery. Um, they, they have a much lower self-discharge rate, and so they can sit for up to two years and still retain 80% of their charge. So you might want to think about going to a dry cell automotive battery. Well, that's great. Uh, where, do I, where do I pick up one of those battery, uh, you mentioned some sort of battery uh, saver thing. Uh, battery maintainers can be purchased just about anywhere from AutoZone to Walmart to name any auto parts store. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to point out, if you are going to disconnect the battery, everyone needs to hear this. You always disconnect the negative battery cable first. We don't start with the positive. That's not the way to do it. We don't want sparks and batteries exploding in our face. So when we come back, we've got a couple open lines at 602 277-5827-602-277. KTR, you're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and filling in for Matt Allen, we've got Glenn Hayward from Good Works Auto Repair. Glenn brought with him C. Char C. Michael Decker to talk about batteries. The guy's been in the industry for 30 years, and we are taking your phone calls we are going to go with Lewis in Phoenix on an O2 PT Cruiser. Go ahead, Lewis. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, well, when I'm on the highway and I hit it like about 55 miles per hour, I get like a bad wobble. On my, it feels like on the right side wheel or something. And if I accelerate over 55, it goes away. And if I decelerate, it goes away too. So... So I was just wondering what the problem could be with that. Yeah, I think, uh, what, what do you think there, Glenn? Well, it could be a number of things. Uh, you may have, uh, you could have a bad motor mount, number one, that can cause a problem like that. Uh, two, you could have a wheel out of balance. You could have a slight ply separation in one of your tires. So it's something that uh, you probably ought to take it over and have it looked at by a tire shop. Um, PT Cruisers have really weak motor mounts in them, and when those things get really loose, they can give you a shake or a wobble, uh, because of the axles rotating and so on, it could be actually the axle could be um, vibrating and creating your vibration. Then, as that goes away, as the speed increases or decreases, that may be why the acceleration or deceleration will eliminate the problem or reduce it significantly. When I see a, a small window of speed where I got a vibration, the first thing, and those are all things that, that uh, we've seen vibrations from motor mounts uh, at those speeds, definitely on a PT Cruiser. But um, the first place I would go would be to, you could, if you're a guy that does stuff in your driveway, rotate your tires and then go take it out and go 55 miles an hour. That's going to be your quickest way to diagnose whether you've got a, 
a uh, tire problem or we do have something like a mount problem or an axle problem going on. So we see more and more as the years go on with these axles, more and more issues with out of balance axles causing issues. And it's a lot of times it's, you know, in that ex acceleration, deceleration type of thing. So thanks so much for the call. Looks like we're going to go with Glenn in Tempe with a battery question that's appropriate. Go ahead, Glenn, you're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, I actually have two different questions about charging batteries. Uh, one of them, a friend of mine's got a uh, Toyota Land Cruiser, and it's a 24-volt. It has two 12-volt batteries in it. Can he charge that with, it, uh, with like, one of the battery tender uh, chargers? It's only for a 12-volt battery? Yeah, and yes, he so, can. He does would... he need to unhook the batteries to do that? No, he can he can charge those batteries ind individually with a 12 volt charger and leave them hooked in series. The only place he gets 24 volts is at the negative of one battery and the positive of the other battery. So if he's using the the terminals of one battery, he can use the 12 volt charger. Okay, and your second question, Glenn, go ahead. Uh, at Harbor Freight sells inexpensive tools. Uh, they have a battery charger that you can buy, set on your dash, and plug into the cigarette lighter for cars that are not driven very often that are in the sun. Because it comes from Harbor Freight, how do you actually know the thing works? Well, uh, I've never had experience with one of those. Have you, Charles? I, I've never purchased one from Harbor Freight. I have purchased other brands, and they do work. Uh, but basically all they do is counteract the parasitic draw of the computer or the clock that's on your radio uh, they will not charge your battery they'll just maintain it um, simply because they're not a big enough solar panel to generate enough power to charge ah man i'm glad we got the battery guy here today because he's there's there's no battery question he hasn't been asked if you guys want to follow up at bumper to bumper radio.com we're going to take some more calls here but uh, with any battery questions, I'll make sure to get them to Charles. Maybe something you didn't ask, but you wanted to call in on for sure. So we're going to go with, looks like, Robert in Avondale on a 2004 Saturn. Go ahead, Robert. You're on Bumper to Bumper. Yeah. Problem driving my car home from work. First, the brights kept staying on, and then I noticed that it started smoking from the turn indicator. And then every time I would have my turn signal on, my high beams would stay on until the turn signal was off. And then the next day I just woke up with a dead battery. Mm. So I'm not sure what was going on there. Sounds like we got something going there in the, you know, the clock spring or the multi-function switch there, turn signal switch in the dashboard. What do you think, Glenn? Yeah, it sounds like uh, your multi-function switch may have a malfunction. And uh, you're going to have to have that checked and, and diagnosed and see where it's shorting out and, and open probability is going to need to be replaced. That's not a job that you probably would want to take on yourself. You need to take it to a reputable shop and have them take a look at that for you. And if you're looking for a reputable shop, bumper to bumper radio com. All the shops on there are great guys, people you can trust, people you can start a relationship with. We're going to sneak in Charles from Surprise and an 01 Silverado. Go ahead, Charles. You're on bumper to bumper radio. You there, Charles? All right, we're going to actually go ahead and slip over to Mike on a 2006 Chevrolet Duramax. Go ahead, Mike. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, I just recently purchased this uh, Chevrolet Duramax from a guy up in Cornville, Arizona. It's got 35,000 miles on it. It has the original Delco batteries in it. What are your thoughts on the uh, dry cell batteries? I've looked at two major manufacturers. Uh, can I mention them? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, one of them was an Odyssey. And the other one is an X2 from a local company here in town. Okay, I see. Uh, I see uh, Charles over here salivating. So uh, <laughs> let me let me go ahead and turn <laughs> it over to him. That's a worth the price. <laughs> that's a great question. Go ahead, Charles. Well, I I have experience with both of those brands. Uh, I'm I'm very much uh, leaning toward the Odyssey. That's the brand that I have sold and uh, had very very good success with. Um, the X2, uh, I haven't had much experience with, but um, from what I've seen, the Odyssey stands behind their product, and in a diesel application, what you need is high cranking power when you hit the key, and uh, that's what the Odyssey provides. 
Uh, those dry cell batteries short circuit at 3,600 amps. And if you've got two of them in your Duramax, that will be plenty of power to turn that diesel over. That is a great question, Mike. And before the show, we were talking. It looks like the people are wondering, what the heck is a dry cell battery? These things got lead and they got acid in them. But the dry cell batteries don't. In the 2014, you were telling me, the Hondas are going to dry cell batteries. And that's really a technology that's going to be probably taken over. Because I imagine Honda's going to do it if they did it. I, I imagine the rest are going to follow suit. What do you think? I believe that in the next five years, we'll see the wet lead acid batteries disappear, that dry cell batteries will take over. Um, the AGM type dry cell is the most popular and seems to be the one that works the best. So if you see AGM, it just means absorbed glass mat. There's still electrolyte in the battery, but it's all absorbed into the separators of the plates. Well, that sounds good. Thanks, Glenn, for coming in, and thanks, uh, Michael, for coming in as well. Tell us about the location of your shop if they want to get a hold of you. Well, Goodworks is at uh, the corner, northeast corner of Broadway and Price Road, and 